All right. Good morning. Uh, this is Texas A&M AgriLife Extension Harris County office coming to you the first day of April. This uh, there are no jokes necessarily in this presentation today, but it is Paul Winsky, so we never know what we'll get. Um, again, thank you. You can see our schedule for April and May. Uh, next week is sausage making and um, and again, these are only twice a month, uh, so there are two talks per month. And then the first one in May is uh, benefits of bats, and then we'll hear from Paul again, house plants. So remember that you can register for any and all of these talks uh, at the same time. So you can register three months ahead of time if you would like. Uh, so for today, we have Paul Winsky presenting Southern Bulbs. Uh, Paul Winsky is the horticulture agent here in Harris County, and uh, I think we all look forward to uh, finding out a little bit more on the bulbs that we can grow around Harris County. Welcome, Paul. Well, thank you, Brandy, and thank you, Harris County, for joining us. Uh, if you are new to the Homegrown Lecture Series, I want to welcome you, and if you are a return uh, visitor, it's great to have you back. Uh, as Brandy said, we are going to talk about Southern Bulbs. Okay, my slides are advancing, that's great. Um, and so this is uh, a, a new talk for me uh, in, in pulling this together. I had an idea on, on where I wanted to go with it, but um, there's a really, there's a lot of good information and there's really a lot of good plants that you can now work into the landscape um and and continue uh that color range and and continue interest in that landscape that's the main thing uh whether i'm talking to master gardeners or anybody in general is we're able to provide color throughout the year and these bulbs are just another tool uh, to bring that color into your gardens and landscape so uh first thing is what are bulbs all right we we a little bit of botany here uh, these structures provide energy um, for the plants to grow. So if we look at uh, this bulb on the side, and this is the typical tulip bulb, uh, we have that, that papery outer covering is called a tunic, and that's there for protection, keeps it from drying out. Uh, and then if we come down the root, uh, down the, to the base here, we have uh, our roots would come from the base. Uh, so when planting, we always want to make sure the nose is pointed up uh, and it does occur that people will plant these upside down. Um, you know, when we've got a green plant, we'd say the green side up. Well, with bulbs, you want to make sure that point or that nose is pointing up. Um, the unique thing about a bulb is this is this basal stem or this basal plate is actually the stem of the plant. So the stem is below ground. Uh, and it's at the, the base here. And then from it is where the, the scales uh, protrude or, or develop. And then we've got the actual growing point. So these scales are energy in order for that bulb to start to emerge and grow because initially the roots aren't there. So when you plant, we'll get some root development and then these scales will provide energy to get this growing point, this flower bud, uh, that, that stem to come up, that foliage to come up. So um, it's, a, it's a unique um, organ or structure, um, but it's very efficient uh, uh, and it works extremely well for the plants that are grown this way. Now, you may hear that uh, we talk about bulbs and that's usually a, a general uh, term that we use. There are true bulbs, so if you think about the lily or the tulips, um, they're true bulbs. Uh, if you talk about crocus um, and some of the other uh, smaller bulbs, they're called corms. Uh, they're a little bit smaller, different modification. If you grow dahlias, they're tuberous roots, so that would even come under, um, you know, that general a term of the bulb. And then last, we've got rhizomes, which are underground stems that grow. So iris, uh, alstroemeria. I used to grow alstroemeria out, out in California, and uh, the rhizomes were the main growing points on this. So uh, just a brief overview of what bulbs are and, and, and how they perform. 
So a little bit about culture and maintenance, okay? So purchasing, um, it's like anything else, whether you're purchasing uh, six packs of color, uh, if you're purchasing a fruit tree, um, you wanna check for signs of disease or damage. You don't want any cuts or bruises. And so we can see this image down here, the lower image, is what we want to see uh, in the bulbs. And usually you're going to see these in a bag, you know, maybe 12 bulbs and it's going to be a mesh bag. So you can see, you can feel it, you can squeeze them, you know, sort of like the way onions are sold in, in the grocery store. So you want to make sure you are getting a, a good healthy bulb to start with. Uh, if we start off with a good healthy bulb, we're going to get good growth, we're going to have good plants. We don't want to see something like this where that, that tunic, that papery cover is, is falling off. You can see there's disease um, or, or some fungus issues here. Uh, if you see that, pass it off. Uh, don't purchase it um, and, and look for some better bulbs. Uh, they should be firm, okay? Uh, they shouldn't be mushy. You know, sometimes you even with onions, you know, when you squeeze them, if, they're, if they've got a, a soft spot, you're not going to buy it. Do the same thing with your bulbs. Uh, if you see any mold on them, stay away from it. Um, once you plant them, they're really low maintenance uh, with these uh, uh, southern bulbs. Uh, uh, they will perennialize, they'll establish, they'll start to divide and develop and, and, and be a nice uh, additional feature into your landscape. So that yearly show, thinking of it as another type of perennial uh, that you are adding into your garden. So site prep, we normally want to have it in full sun. Um, once they're up and growing, uh, they're going to do much better. Now there are some bulbs uh, that would prefer some shade, but in general, um, full sun is where we want to be. The other thing is, it, it is good, and this isn't always possible, but if it could be sheltered from, you know, damaging winds and, you know, March, April, we can we can get quite windy here. Some people, you know, some of these stalks are quite tall. Uh, and, and so some will stake those flower stalks when they come up, those stems when they come up uh, in order to, um, you know, so it doesn't bend over and break. The last thing you want to do is look forward to this uh, flower stem comes up. You can see the buds on it and then we get a very bad storm or it gets windy and that thing bends over and, and breaks or, or pinches uh, that stem and you don't get to enjoy that flower. So if we can put it in a shelter spot, great. If not, consider staking it uh, in order to just give it a little bit of extra uh, reinforcement. Um, we wanna avoid those low lying areas mainly because if they stay too wet, especially after we plant and that bulb hasn't quite established and isn't quite growing yet, um, it can lead to rot. Uh, it could get to diseased and, and that bulb will never even come up. Uh, so we, we want to avoid that. So just like any other preparation, we want well-drained soil. We want to amend with compost or expanded shale if, if it's a poor draining, if, if you've got some serious issues. Uh, and you want to work that organic matter into that planting area in, in order to improve it as much as possible, in order to get that bulb off to a good start. Fertilizing, it can be done. Um, we did a trial several years back. I'll, I'll show you a slide of that later on. Uh, we did not put any additional fertilizer in. Uh, we amended with compost and that was fine, but um, super phosphate or triple phosphate, 0.18.0 or 0.46.0 are often uh, recommended. Uh, and that will help with uh, that phosphate, phos phosphate or the phosphorus helps with the root development uh, on the bulb. So it's not going to hurt if you're putting in uh, planting individual bulbs, um, probably about a tablespoon or uh, in, in each hall will, will be fine. You mix it up with the soil. Um, uh, if you want to use bone meal, that's also recommended also. So Fertilizing can be done, may not be needed, uh, especially once they're established. Um, usually there aren't any issues, but usually at planting is, is when that uh, fertilizer is, is often added. Planting. All right, so how you've got these bulbs. What's, what's the best way to plant these things? How, 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 how can I get the biggest, best effect in my garden? Um, it, it's like we normally say odd number groups are always 
going to look better. Um, so if you if you if you've got 12 bulbs uh, and you break them down into uh, three groups of four uh, and you position them around in the garden, uh, that's great. Or you can mass plant. Um, I had the uh, privilege of, of being over in uh, Holland several years back and I got to go to uh, the uh, Kuchenhof Gardens uh, when there everything was in bloom and um, you talk about mass plantings it was impressive everything from high uh, from uh, hyacinths daffodils tulips you name it um, so it it just has that wow effect um, when to plant if you if it is a spring flowering bulb all right you're going to want to plant usually late summer or early fall um, if it's a summer flowering bulb so if it's something that's going to bloom for us in uh, july august september now is the time to start putting those bulbs in uh, it will allow them to establish they'll get a root system and um, they'll be uh, ready to uh, put their show on for you uh, during their normal bloom time. Uh, depth of planting, it, and this just, it, 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 it depends. Uh, and that's a great answer that we always start with when we're uh, in extension. Um, the package, package will normally have uh, directions on it as to how deep to plant. Uh, general rule for most bulbs is you plant it two to three times deeper than their diameter. Uh, so if it's a one inch diameter bulb, uh, well, it's got to be at least two to three inches below the, the soil surface. So um, just as an easy rule of thumb. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, please, please, please plant with the pointed end facing up. Um, it just makes it a lot easier. The, the plant does not have to put the energy into, if it's upside down, that, that growing point will start, but then it has to go and curve and come up. Uh, and that's a lot of energy that goes into it. Um, so we wanna plant them the right way uh, the first time uh, and, and, and um, get that bulb uh, started in the right direction. Uh, the, the images here you can see, so if you're, if you're planting in group, um, you know, you can just dig this hole uh, depending on the number of bulbs that you have, uh, the diameter of it, and you get it to the depth. If you're doing single uh, bulb plantings, uh, you can come in with a trowel and, and just dig to that depth that you need. And you can see here on the side, uh, you know, they've got uh, their bulbs in here grouped together. Uh, it's nice and easy. You set them in, come back over with your soil, cover it up. Uh, and you've got a nice patch there of uh, potential uh, flowering bulbs that will come up. And here you see the same uh, for the individual bulb if it's planted that way. You want to cover it, you want to mulch it, you want to water them in. Uh, the main thing you want to do is make sure you get that moisture uh, down around that bulb. You want that soil to come in contact with those bulbs. So you want to get the air out, get that moisture in, and then really you can just let them go. Um, you know, now depending if it's a, a spring planting, you know, you're going to have to watch your watering a little bit more because we can get into some dry spells. Okay. Um, but usually with fall planting, that initial watering in is probably going to be fine because that soil is not going to be drying out as often or quickly. We'll get some fall rains, the temperatures are cooler. So that soil usually stays moist enough that you don't need the initial watering or a, a, a additional watering. Uh, and then the other thing is make sure you label it because you know when you plant these, you can forget where they are. And the last thing you want to do is uh, run into the issue of uh, forgetting that they're there and you go to dig dig uh, to put something else in and you forgot those bulbs are there. So so please, I know you guys are all great gardeners and you probably got everything labeled, but make sure you label them or, or put some sort of flag there or something so you know those bulbs are there. Um, bulb planting tools to make your life easier. Uh, they've come a long way. So up top right hand corner here, uh, this is how they do these uh, planting in mass in drift. They, they will actually come in and, and, and scrape off the top uh, two inches or three inches, depending on the bulb. Uh, they will then lay them out and then they'll come back in and cover uh, with that topsoil. So, um, you know, th this is for those uh, long, long, long sweeping areas uh, in those uh, display beds. 
Uh, these other two tools down below here, these bulb planners, come in very handy if you're doing individual bulbs. Uh, it makes life a lot easier. Uh, now, they can be a little bit challenging uh, if you're doing directly into clay soil, but if you've got your your beds amended, um, both of these bulb planters uh, work extremely well. This one, you're going to have to use a little bit more arm strength, upper body. Uh, this one's nicer because you can put the weight of your foot, you, know, you can put your foot and put the, uh, the weight of your body behind it, uh, and it makes a nice uh, hull. And, and you can judge the, 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 uh, the depth on that, whether it's two, three, four. Uh, most of these are usually about four to six inches deep. Uh, the other one, which I've seen lately, I, I have not tried this yet, but now they sell these auger bits that you can attach to your power drill uh, and drill out these holes. And, and these are made at different depths also. Uh, and so it just makes life a little bit easier. So, hey, if you can save, save a little bit of uh, time, uh, a little bit of energy, and it makes it easier, then by all means, uh, give it a shot. But, um, you know, we want to work smarter. We don't necessarily always have to work harder because we do enough hard work when we're out there gardening. Uh, one of the other things that you're going to have to do is probably deadhead these. Um, we want to limit the seed production, mainly because we don't want the energy um, of the foliage going into forming seeds we want that energy from the foliage you know it still can photosynthesize we want it going back into that bulb so it will make more um you know bulb bills or, or bulbs uh, uh lateral bulbs will form down below and we'll get a, a, a larger cluster uh later on so um, we want to go ahead and deadhead and the other thing we want to do is by all means if you can um, allow that foliage to die back naturally. Uh, so this is what um, one uh, person does. They, they actually, they fold it over uh, and they're actually using some of the leaves, the foliage to just tie it off. So it looks a little bit cleaner. Um, when I used to work at a golf course, we would take them, bend them over, just put a rubber band around them so they looked a little bit neater. So the other thing is, you know, hopefully you've got these worked into areas where your perennials are starting to come up and wake up and your perennials can fill in over top. You don't have to look at that, um, that foliage as it dies back uh, and, and they, they just work really well hand in hand. Um, you, you want to, again, by all means, keep that foliage on there as long as possible until it dries out because it's just going to help the overall health of the bulb. Uh, it'll help with the production of bulbs in the future uh, and you'll have a lot more flowers to look at in the seasons to come. Okay, so we've got um, some information uh, just to, to cover the general. Um, Brandy or Shannon, I see you guys are there. Are, are there any questions before I get into uh, some of the species that we can plant? Okay, actually, um, well, I, I, I go ahead. Yeah, I was kind of waiting for Shannon, but uh, I'll go ahead. There is one question, how to keep squirrels from digging up bulbs. Great question. And usually what they recommend is putting a wire mesh over top of the area uh, where you just planted. Uh, the squirrels won't like it. They won't be able to dig there uh, because that wire mesh is, is lay and it just has to lay on the surface. Uh, but that is one way of keeping those, you know, uh, squirrels that can, can cause problems uh, out of that patch. So wire mesh over the top of that area will keep them out. Uh, I see Christine has, should the tunic be peeled off when planting amaryllis? No, J just leave that papery coverage, uh, that papery layer on there and, and just plant it up. It does provide a little bit of protection uh, and over time it, 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 will, um, it, it will decay, but that plant will continue to put um, to develop that that tunic or that papery cover cover uh, as it matures. So, okay, great. I think we are good. I'm not seeing anything else there. So let's talk about some of the species that you can put uh, into the landscape that you can use in your garden. Uh, the first one is Lycoris aurea, the yellow spider lily. 
Uh, and just look at the, uh, the the flower production on that. It's it's got these nice petals that that fold back. They got a little ruffle to them. Um, but I, I I'm really impressed with the the, the length of these anthers um, uh, where the filaments and then the anthers are on it. It, it just adds a whole nother dimension um, to that uh, flower uh, that cluster as it, as it comes into bloom. So normally planting for this is, is spring through fall um, and bloom bloom time is going to be mid fall. So, you know, depending on our how, how our seasons are going, um, you know, end of September into October, sometimes a little earlier, sometimes a little later. But in that fall area, it, it, it produces these, you know, very vibrant golden yellow flowers. Um, when you plant this, you want to plant this one. This is one that recommends um, three inches below the soil surface when you plant. And then the height on this is anywhere from 18 to 24 inches. And this is one of the ones that sort of falls under that. You may have heard the common name. People will call it naked ladies. Um, and so the Lycoris, what happens is, is when this blooms, that flowering spike comes up first, no foliage. Uh, and you get these spikes come up. Uh, and then you get this cluster of flowers and then after blooms, then it's followed by um, the foliage which will emerge. So this is like core. This is the yellow spider lily and then we've got the red one. OK, and this gives you a better idea how it comes up in the clusters and you can see these are just all flower spikes. There is no foliage uh, at this point on this plant. So again, we want to plant this uh, spring or fall. This is a different species. This is radiata, Lycoris radiata. Uh, bloom time is early fall. Uh, it's got this nice red color. And you, you know, those flower heads on both of these Lycoris, you know, enjoy them in the garden or also cut them as a, uh, as a cut flower, put them in a vase and enjoy them indoors. So you've got value added. Don't, you know, you can just, you can also enjoy it uh, in the house, in, in, in your house. Um, again, planting depth two to three inches and that height is 12 to 16. So, you know, this is where you can see that 12 to 16 is, is a pretty sturdy height. Um, but if you can give it a little bit of added protection in case we are extremely windy in the fall, um, you know, you don't want to have those uh, stems bend and break on you. Now the next one is the oxblood lily, or sometimes a common name is that schoolhouse lily. And this is Rhodophilia uh, bifida. Uh, this is one that you want to plant in the spring or fall. Bloom time is early fall. So the first three that we've talked about, we've got fall bloomers, okay? So we're always thinking about, you know, that succession. When can I, what, when can I have interest in that garden? So these three work extremely well together. We've got two reds, a yellow. We've got a little bit different look here. This has got more of a trumpet shape um, flower on it. Nice red color. Uh, again, planting this one about two to three inches below the soil line. And the height on this is, is 10 to 16 inches. Um, this is one of the, the ones, uh, if you drive, you know, the back roads through Texas and you come across some old homesteads, and you'll see this in the fall and you'll see just clusters of these just pop up, but there's no house there. I bet you if, if you were to get out of the car and, and go look, it's probably near the foundation uh, of that house and off the corner of the house or something like that. It, it is just, you know, you talk about Texas tough bulbs, you know, those Lycoris, this oxblood lily, um, you know, once you plant them, uh, and if they're in a happy spot, they're there, uh, you know, basically forever. Uh, the house is gone. Um, you know, there's nothing there at this point, but those lilies come up year after year. Uh, and it's really great to uh, to see them. So as you drive around, uh, especially in the taking those country roads, coming through some of the smaller towns, you'll see these popping up in various spots. And most times uh, they're probably near an old foundation where the house or a barn used to be. Now here's another type of spider lily. So this is why I, you know, I, I like to, to stick with the botanical names because uh, this is a uh, Hymena callus. Uh, and this one is just really, this gives you a, a, a nice tropical feel uh, when it comes into bloom. 
So planting time for this is 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 now. You know, we can we can put these in starting in mid March after the the last chance of freeze, uh, up until about August. And this is a late summer bloomer, but this is you can see it, it gets this nice dark green, very lustrous foliage, strap like foliage will come up. Uh, and then these flower spikes will come uh, and you know this is one flower head so you could see the, the 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 cluster of these flowers and it's very unique where they've got this uh, central petal and then we've got the uh, leaflets uh, petals coming off of it and then you've got these long filaments uh, with the anthers so you know you could see this gently swaying in the breeze is is has a really nice effect and it, it's got a uh, especially the, those white colors uh, in late summer uh, at dawn or dusk will really pop in the landscape so they uh, it, it, they look extremely um, um, vibrant at that time uh, you want to plant this at the depth of the height of the bulb so you want to get it you know below the surface if it's a if it's a a larger bulb and and these hymenocallus are our larger bulbs uh, and then when they bloom those flower spikes anywhere from 12 to 36 inches as the plant gets larger as it matures those flower spikes are going to be more plentiful and you're going to see um, more flower spikes coming off of it so um, great looking uh, bulb to have into the landscape now these rain lilies i'm going to cover two species here this is habranthus robustus this is the pink rain lily uh, you can plant these anytime and these these bulbs are going to be very you know small um, this is obviously uh, the pink flowering one bloom time is in the summer and they're called rain lilies because you normally they they almost they go dormant in the summer you might see some foliage but normally they're they're pretty dormant um yeah the foliage will be up um but if we get a nice heavy rain if we if we've been dry for several weeks and then we get a nice heavy rain and a very good soaking rain all of a sudden the, these guys just wake up and they put on the show so it, it, it's one of those that you know you have it there know where it is um and then when you know when we're getting a nice good rain um sit back and wait for these guys to wake up because you're going to see uh, quite the flower explosion on these. And you can see these in, in some of the fields when you drive these homesteads that they're out there uh, and there's nothing. And after a rain, all of a sudden, these guys just pop up some of the native um, uh, species that are out there. Height is about eight to 10 inches. So they're not a very tall uh, plant. They're single flower spikes that come up, but when they are in clusters, um, the the uh, effect is really nice. And then there's a white rain lily. So this you can see this is a different species. Uh, this is Zephyranthes candida uh, and pretty much the same. You, you, you know, you can plant these anytime. Bloom is late summer through fall, depending on when that moisture is there. This is a white flowering version. Um, plant at soil level and height on this is about six to 10 inches. There's also uh, a yellow flowering version of this. So the rain lilies, there's a lot of options out there, um, but they're one of those that really they'll just pop up and surprise you um, and, and when you least expect it. But you know when you get that rain um, is when you're gonna get that show. Uh, crinums, um, if you want bold, um, large trumpet shaped flowers um, crinums this is a, a great you know pass along plant um, you can plant these anytime bloom time is in the summer um, the color on these is is it varies uh, three of the species or three of the varieties that you normally see is um, this is ellen boson k up in the right hand corner uh, so you've got that dark pink color um, i've had this in my garden for Gosh, I've been here 20 plus years. I bet you at least 15, 18, 15 to 18 years. Um, the one thing with crinums, when you plant them, um, put them in a, a spot where you where you're, you where you want it, um, and just let it go because uh, digging these guys out, uh, these bulbs get larger, and then as they mature, they the, the roots almost they they pull them down deeper. Um, and so you're going to have to, if you put a bulb in uh, and you come back five years later and you say, well, I want to dig it and move it, um, you're going to you're going to have quite the job uh, at, at hand in order to get try and get that bulb out. 
uh, and you may break a few spades uh, trying to do it. So um, these are great once established. Mine is coming back from the freeze. I've got all new growth coming on it, so I know I'm going to have flowers. But th this is Alan Bozen K. Um, the next one over here, this white with the light pink on the outside and on the tips is Mrs. James Hendry. And then this lower one down here, this is milk and wine. It has this uh, purplish maroon stripe through it. So um, they do well in full sun. They do well in part shade. Um, but this is, a, again, one of those uh, southern bulbs that's that's once you plant it um, and it's it, it doesn't get uh, I guess it's not an aggressive grower, but once it's established, it's there and you're going to have it. Um, plant these uh, where the stem emerges from the neck of the bulb. So that's what this image is here. So if you purchase the bulb or or if you, if you buy a pot, you want to plant it a little bit higher. But if you have a bulb, um, we want it uh, up to the soil surface here uh, where that neck is. And then where that stem emerges, we want to have that stem above the soil surface. Uh, you don't want to plant this thing uh, completely below the surface because there's a good chance that uh, we may run into some disease issues. This may rot uh, and that bulb won't establish. Um, height on this when it's in bloom is anywhere from 12 to 28 inches. As it matures, as it establishes, those flower spikes will get taller. Um, this one I think is kind of interesting. This is leucogium. Uh, it's called, common name is Summer Snowflakes, um, but it blooms in February. Uh, so I'm not sure how it got that name. This is one you plant in the fall. Uh, you get these nice clusters. This, this It almost has, if, if you've ever seen, um, uh, it, to me it reminds me a little bit of Lily of the Valley because uh, I'm from the Northeast. Um, but it gets these uh, little flower spikes and these uh, white flowers, bell-shaped, sort of open, and they just sort of nod off. They just hang there. They get these little green tips uh, on the back side of it. Um, but it's 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 nice because it's you know things are going to start to wake up when this starts to bloom. Uh, so this is another one where it it looks good in a cluster. So you know you would dig um, that hole, and if you've got six bulbs, put all six bulbs together because you'll get a nice little cluster uh, of this uh, uh, plant as it starts to bloom. And height is nor it, it is about 12 to 14 inches, and that that that's about right. Right, right about there is 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 where you're going to see the flower production on these. But this is a uh, Leucogium uh, summer snowflakes. Now narcissus daffodils. Um, there are 12 different groups uh, of narcissus. There's two groups that do especially uh, especially well here: the tazettas, which I'm going to talk about, and then the other one are the jonquils. So if you want, um, I would I would focus on those two groups. Uh, if you want to use them to naturalize an area, um, they're the ones to consider. So these are a fall planting and blooming time is going to be, you know, sort of after the first of the year, depending on our conditions. Could be in January, could be late January, could be early February. Um, some of the varieties of the Tazettas are Italicus. Uh, the, the one nice thing about all these Tazettas are their fragrance. They do have a fragrance. So if you want to cut them and bring them in the house, you can have some nice fragrance or you just enjoy them outside. Um, so we have Italicus. Golden Dawn is this image up here in the upper right hand cor corner. So it's got the, the darker, um, the golden cup uh, against the yellow uh, petals. So it's a nice um, contrast. Uh, then we have Grand Primo, which sort of has this pale cup against this nice, uh, clean white uh, petals. And then the er other one, which, which is quite popular, is uh, Early Cheer. And it's got this creamy white. It's almost like a double type. Uh, and they're, they're just, the, the flower head is just full, is this full cluster. Um, like I said, they all have a nice, sweet fragrance. Uh, some of them can be a little bit stronger than others. Um, and their height is going to be about 12 to 4, 24 inches. Uh, and this is one that will naturalize. So if you put in a cluster, it will, you know, expand over time uh, and continue that flower production uh, throughout the years. Hardy Amaryllis, uh, Hippiaestrum uh, Johnsonii. 
this is a, again another one of those that um, you'll see driving along uh, the backcountry roads and you'll just see a, a cluster of these pop up somewhere um, probably where an old homestead used to be so planting these in the fall or the spring uh, is ideal bloom time for these is spring there's a couple uh, folks in the neighborhood theirs have, have come up and, and bloomed already uh, it's got that nice red um, color on the petals with a, a white streak through the middle so you get a nice contrast of the red and white um, on the depth even with you know we we know that the, the amaryllis that we normally plant you know you see on the holidays um, you want to plant these where the tops or that nose is above the soil uh, you don't want want it uh, buried because we could it could lead to um, disease or fungal problems so you want to plant these a little bit higher and then again as these mature these are going to develop larger clumps and um, you'll just have you know that much more of a flower uh, power to it uh, over the years flowering height on this is anywhere from one to two feet again as they mature, they're going to get taller because there's going to be more energy in that bulb. There's going to be more more bulbs there, uh, and those uh, plants are going to uh, put on a an even better flower show. Um, next one is the Philippine lily. Uh, I I like this one. This is Lilium formosanum. Uh, this is not. It looks the flower looks like the. Uh, Lilium longiflorium, which we're seeing now during Easter, uh, but this one is a tall grower. So this one you can plant this time of year and it's going to bloom July and August. Uh, it's got that typical lily look to it, um, that trumpet shaped flower, but on the back side, uh, you know, you've got this purple throat that you see on the back side of it. it. It doesn't transfer through to the interior, but you just see it on the back side. Um, the interesting thing is that the dwarf variety on this is three to four feet tall. So typically, if it's the, the straight Formosanum, we're looking at six feet tall. And I, I've seen these that are, you know, I'm just about six feet, I'm just under six feet, and I've seen them taller than me where you, you sort of just look up at those flowers and they're they're nodding there at you. So um, this is one that you're gonna wanna put, if you have it, put it in the back of your bed because of the height of it. Um, don't put it up front because it's gonna look lost. Uh, and, and um, but, you know, for summer flower production, um, you know, this is a great plant to have uh, in your garden. The other one I really like uh, that I've seen down here is, is the Byzantine gladiola. Um, this is gladiola communis, uh, variety Byzantinus. Um, plant this in the fall. Uh, the color on this just really pops. Um, it's a spring bloomer. I've seen a couple blooming around here already or, or they finished up, but that it's almost like an iridescent magenta color. Uh, and so even if it's in the shade, that color pops um, for it. So I, I just really like it. It adds that height. It adds some structure. Uh, it's a great cut flower also. So um, there's, a, there's a lot of advantages to this one. Um, planting depth on this is about four inches deep, so four inches below the uh, soil surface. And then that height is anywhere from two to three feet. So, uh, you know, the the other gladiola don't do as well here, but this, uh, you know, this this species, the communis, uh, the Byzantine gladiola just does, uh, puts on a, a really nice show uh, in our area. Now, tulips, everybody loves tulips. And the question is, can we grow them here? And the answer is yes. This is a trial we did back in, I think it was about 2015. We we took we we grew five varieties, um, and there's a hundred bulbs in each of those clusters. So, uh, working with the master gardeners, they dug that uh, the diameter of that hole was about three inches across. I mean, three inches, three feet across, um, and all 100 bulbs about, uh, and it was dug about three to four inches below the soil surface. Um, and then the 100 bulbs, those 100 bulbs were all placed within that three foot diameter uh, hole. Uh, and then we covered it over. Now the, the, the key to this is if you wanna do tulips, um, first of all, it's gonna be a one shot deal. Think of it as an annual, okay? It is not, they are not going to overwinter for us. They are not gonna make it through the heat of the summer in the soil. 
Um, so it's it's a one and done. So if you can if you can put your head around that and don't have an issue with it, um, by all means you can you can grow them. So you can purchase these bulbs either pre-chilled um, or you can chill them yourself. So um, the ones that we planted, they were pre-chilled. Uh, the grower, the, the distributor, they came in, they already had their six weeks of cold. Uh, and then we just, when we received them, they went right in the ground. If you purchase them at a store, okay, they're probably not pre-chilled. So you take that bag of bulbs, it's in that mesh bag, um, and just, hey, every gardener's probably got a refrigerator out in their uh, garage where they store their seeds and stuff like that. You take that bag and put it in that refrigerator, not the freezer, just the refrigerator, for at least six weeks. So if you purchase them in November, that's plenty of time. You put them in in November and uh, you get there, there in November, December, you got eight weeks of chill on them. Uh, that vernalization is what they're gonna need. Um, so you take them out and you can plant them anytime after January 1st is ideal. So for our trial, which you see down here, is we planted in week three of that year, which is right around the we say the week of January 15th. Um, first color came six weeks later. So we are looking at um, the end of February for week nine. Our peak color was week 11, which was probably about two weeks, the first two weeks of March. And then by the end of March, they finished blooming. And then that's it. You're gonna have the, 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 the um, foliage there. Um, if you need that bed, you just pull them out um, because they will not perennialize. They will not um, make it through the, the heat of the summer. So it's a one shot deal. Now, the one thing that is nice about this is if you want to expand that flowering period, you can um, plant these in waves. So, you know, from our trial, we could have planted week three. We could have then done another planting two weeks later and then maybe another planting two weeks later. The whole time they're still in that refrigerator. And it, if, it, if they're in there for six weeks, eight weeks, 10 weeks, 12 weeks, it, it's not going to matter. Um, once they have that chilling period, they're fine. But then you, you've got a longer uh, um, viewing period or flower period for these. And uh, they will just, you know, continue to, uh, each wave will, will bloom after the other. So you have a succession plan. So if you want tulips, you can do them. Um, just be aware that it's going to be a one one shot deal. Now, there are some species um, that do well in Texas, but they're more for, um, say, uh, the Austin area um, and then north of us. Um, I don't see them doing well because they're they're usually like a zone eight or so. And so, um, you know, we're just a little bit too, too warm, too hot, probably too wet that they don't perennial perennialize for us. Um, and then I, I went ahead and I, I threw in a couple tropicals for because what the heck they are bulbs and they need their place here also. So common name elephant ears. We see these all over the place. They're actually three different species, Colocasia, Alocasia, and, Van, and Xantha Simona. Um, these got that great bold foliage. So you want that tropical feel, you know, consider these. You can plant these year round, ideally in the spring after that initial threat of, of frost is gone um, for that first planting. Height on these varies. Uh, planting depth is going to be normally at least two inches below the surface. So we see uh, this image down below. We see the typical green um, foliage ones. Some of them are glossy. Some of them are, are more muted. But there has been quite a bit of breeding out of Hawaii. Um, and they were actually, these are byproducts from uh, taro production. Uh, the breeder came across some of these uh, unique uh, crosses. And so there's an ornamental uh, aspect to it. So um, these are really have the wow factor. Um, they will do well in full sun. A little bit of shade was, is fine also, but um, you know, 
keep an eye out. Um, there's a series, I think it's called the Hilo series, you know, for Hilo Hawaii. And um, they've got some really unique ones. And you'll find those, they're going to be sold in pots. The foliage is going to be up already, so you would just have to transplant it. Um, the bulbs on those aren't available uh, for sale. But um, these green ones, you know, I've even seen these in Sam's where you can buy these. Uh, the typical green ones already are, are out there on the market. And then the last one is our caladiums. Um, you know, we're in the south. Caladiums do great through the heat of the summer. They add texture. They add color. This is a trial we did several years back. Um, you want to hold off on planting these. You know, the, the longer you can wait, the better off it's going to be if you're planting the bulb. So this trial went in in May. Um, the warmer that soil is, the better off they perform. And the, the foliage color, you've got greens, pinks, whites, um, uh, you know, j j just some really great uh, combinations. Now, there's two types of caladiums. You've got your fancy leaves, which prefer shade to semi-shade. Uh, and then you've got your strap leaves, which will, which will do much better in sunny conditions. Uh, if you can see my pointer here, this variety here is going to be um, a, uh, a strap leaf little bit shorter, a little bit more heart shaped where um, the fancy leaves, these larger ones, they almost look like the uh, the elephant ears, but they're just got more color to it that, that look. We grow them in full, full, full shade, we grow them in full sun. Um, actually, they both did extremely well in both conditions, but what we did see was um, these fancy leaf, which prefer the shade and the semi shade, they did they did well in full sun, but their colors were a little bit off. Um, they weren't as crisp. They weren't maybe as vibrant as if they were. We compared them to the ones that we grew in the uh, full shade. And then the strap leaves, they just didn't miss a beat. They didn't matter whether they were growing in, in, in sun or full shade. So, you know, the plants don't always read the des descriptions we write about them. But just to give you an idea, the, the color variation, especially on the fancy leaves, uh, is probably going to be a little bit washed out, maybe a little bit muted, as opposed to if you kept it in that uh, semi-shaded or full sh fully shaded area. You plant these about a, uh, one to two inches uh, below the soil surface. Okay, resources. Um, I know I gave uh, both Shannon and Brandy uh, links for, for some uh, fact sheets uh, that you can go to. If you really want to get more in-depth information. These four books are probably um, ones that you would want to have on your bookshelf. Garden Bulbs for the South by Scott Ogden. Uh, the Bulb Hunter Chris by Chris Wessinger. He's also got a, a website, uh, the Southern Bulb Company, where you can purchase a lot of these. And then Dr. Welch, uh, who's an A&M uh, faculty. Greg Grant is also a uh, uh, an extension agent like myself up in the Tyler area. Uh, they've got a book out together, Heirloom Gardening in the South, Yesterday's Plants for Today's Gardens, and then Dr. Welch has Perennial Garden Colors. So um, these are four good books. Uh, if you want to get into it a little bit more, find out uh, maybe other species or other options. Um, these are available out there um, for you to uh, review. So, uh, I want to thank you for joining us today. I know we'll open this up to uh, questions now if there's any. Uh, and so um, either Brandy or Shannon, whoever, um, let me know if, we, if there's any questions that need to be answered uh, and we'll go from there. All right, well, here's one that uh, I think would just be useful to have on the video. Um, the question is, do we leave tulip bulbs in the ground after they have bloomed or do we just leave them and forget them since they are annuals? You, you can do either way. Um, you can leave them there. Um, they will die back uh, and, and you know, that bulb will just basically disintegrate over time. Um, the, the problem is, is if you want to plant in that area. If you don't need to plant in that area, you can leave it. But if you're going to want to plant in that area, you're probably going to want to just come through and just pull them out uh, in order to put your uh, spring to summer flowering annuals or whatever else um, you've got growing in that garden.
OK, uh, let's see. Next question. Well, I can see some of them here. Um, OK, someone had, let's see, their Lycoris aureus tops froze in February. Will they come back in Dallas? Uh, good question. Um, I would I would say they should um, because remember that storage organ that bulb is below the surface now. Um, I don't know. Uh, I know down here our ground didn't freeze uh, and I don't know if the ground froze in Dallas and I guess the other question is is how long that bulb has been in if it's been in there for a while. I would tend to think it's probably going to recover and return and 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 not be an issue. Um, but it's it you know it's one of those things. Keep an eye on it, um, and um, you know just continue to uh, to watch it throughout the rest of the season. But I would I would venture to guess that it should uh, make a recovery. Uh, I see Sally's question: Are most bulbs deer resistant? Uh, and I would say no. Um, uh, they'll eat the tender tips off. Uh, they may root around again as uh, uh, Sally. I don't know if you heard the the answer on you know the uh, squirrels, um, but if you know they if they are are smart enough that uh, they could tell where you just planted because the soil is is soft or something. Um, uh, I would cover that area or or just put some of that uh, wire mesh over top of it so this way they won't. Uh, get dig, dig, you know, get down into that softer soil and and uh, and eat them. But um, yeah, if if those deer are, are hungry enough, they'll especially that soft growth when it comes up, they'll nibble it down, and um, you know, unfortunately, you won't get a chance to uh, enjoy it. Hey, Paul, here's another one. Um, I'm not. Um, so first of all, somebody's wanting to know about how to become a master gardener. I thought that that was a pretty interesting question. And then is Hymeno Hymenocallus lyrosome a shade loving lily? I know I probably killed that, but. Right. So yeah, it, normally you, you so uh, well, first off, your first question, if you want to be a master gardener, um, uh, what I would re recommend is going to the Harris County Master Gardener website. And there is a tab there about becoming a master gardener. Um, there will be a class later this year. Uh, you can click on that tab, put your name and information in, and then when we do an orientation, you will get an email from Brandy uh, letting you know the dates of orientation uh, and you can at least uh, get started that way. And if you have any other questions, you can always call the office and actually ask for Brandy Keller. Uh, she is the program coordinator for the Master Gardener program, and she will be able to steer you in the right direction. Um, the Hymenocallus, they probably, you know, morning sun, afternoon shade, um, you know, so under, you know, uh, a tree, um, they will do fine, but I've seen them in full sun also. So they are, are, are quite hardy and will do well uh, under either condition. So somebody else is giving you uh, two thumbs up. Fantastic presentation. Thank you so much. Will we be able to access a recording for reference? Um, I'm typing it in, typing it in there, but you can go ahead and let everybody know about the YouTube channel, I guess. A absolutely. Well, thank you. I'm 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 glad you enjoyed it. Uh, you know, we're we're here to help educate you uh, on on anything and everything horticulture, urban agriculture. Uh, ag literacy that, that that is our 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 goal here our mission um, yes all of these programs are recorded so uh, if this is your first time here they are all recorded you will receive an email either later today or tomorrow morning um, with a link to a survey and in that email there will also be a link to our YouTube page but you can always go to the YouTube page which I think Shannon is putting that link in and you can see all of the uh, programs that we have done. We actually we are getting close to a year of doing these. So uh, um, we started this in May of last year as a uh, uh, an answer to the issues with uh, COVID-19 and being able to do programming. 
And so last year we did actually, we had 30 different uh, programs. Um, this year we're going to every other, you know, twice a month. And so uh, all of that information is there and it, it's free. So you can go to it, please um, subscribe to our, uh, to our YouTube channel, uh, send the links to friends, let them join because um, that's it. We want, we want you guys to be successful gardeners uh in 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 any way possible uh and that survey we we do take into account you know when we ask for ideas or or comments um you know this southern bulbs this this came out because we we started to see a trend of people asking for that so we did it so um um yeah by all means the information's there uh, and and we're here to uh help you be successful Uh, Paul, you, there's a couple questions that have come in about where to purchase. I did answer earlier, but if you want to expand on that, I just let them know the big box stores always have has them, uh, the family owned businesses, but with the most variety, that would be the um, catalogs. Yeah, uh, and, and, and like I said, you know, uh, Southern Bulb Company, um, there's a company out of Virginia, Brent and Becky Bulbs, um, you can look at. Um, the other company I think is called Brex, B-R-E-C-K-S. Um, so they're, they're probably the three, um, you know, for mail order, for online, you can, you can see what they have, um, what's available. Um, so, um, and actually there's another one, I think they're not, they're, they're not online, but they are on Facebook um they are local it's called bulb house and house is spelled h-a-u-s um that is our other um our fort bend county uh horticulture agent boone holiday uh he's got he grows some on the side and and sells them so if you were to follow his him on facebook page they will let you know when they've got bulbs available and um they are grown locally so um they they are the ones that i would uh recommend looking at uh if when you do a google search um for those companies all right and did the question get answered about the byzantine gladiola uh let, let me see i'm looking i'm seeing christine bloom stalks on my byzantine glads are very short have had them for two years what can i do to make them longer uh christine it's just going to be a maturity uh thing um they they will get taller as more of that plant as that plant develops um they they will they will start to get taller so um you know just just be remember you know when you initially planted and 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 the corms are on on the gladiola are really pretty small so there's not a lot of energy there. So the more bulbs that it starts to develop and as they mature, um, there'll be more energy there and that the, the, the flower spike and the flower show uh, will improve over time. Uh, and I'm seeing one more here. Uh, would most of these bulbs grow in zone seven, North Alabama, or would you have to dig them? Um, uh, most, let me see, I'm trying to think. I would check online or I would check the, I, you've got the names of them. So I, I would do a little bit of research. Um, they, the, most of them should be fine. Uh, I don't think it should be an issue uh, with zone seven. Uh, yes, you can dig your caladiums in the fall. Um, the caladiums are another one that won't, they don't like our cold, wet soils. Um, so if you want to go with the same caladiums year in and year out or season in and season out, you would probably have to dig those, um, dry them out, uh, you know, keep them in the garage. Um, you don't have to refrigerate them, but just keep them uh, dry uh, and then you can come back and plant them uh, the next season. Uh, I, I know especially the uh, uh, the narcissus, uh, the daffodils should be fine. Uh, and the other ones, I, I, I believe they should be fine, um, but you might want to just double check on those. OK. Anything else, team? Nope, that looks like that's it. Thank you, Paul. All right. Well, I want to thank you all for joining us. Don't forget our uh, the rest of our lectures will be back in two weeks. 
with Sausage Making 101 and uh, Mr. Shannon Dietz. So all the programs for the, the rest of the quarter uh, are available uh, to, to register. And um, we just want to thank you for joining us. Uh, enjoy. Hopefully you've got a long weekend coming up. Enjoy this uh, Easter holiday weekend. And we'll see you back here on the 15th. Have a great day.